Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast for epigenetics. In this podcast, we're going to focus on how imprinting is established. On the last podcast, or last two podcasts, we talked a lot about how imprinted genes were turned off and how they could be turned on. We talked about the importance of having just one of those expressed. Though we haven't yet talked about why it's important, but we talked about that if how how if it's not imprinted, there can be some consequences. But the question we want to address in this podcast is how do we establish that initial imprinting? Now we know that that the imprinting has to change at some level. And the reason we know that is because if we think about the maternal and paternal copies of these imprinted genes, and we'll stick with our friend here, IFG. Remember the maternal copy is not expressed and the paternal copy is expressed. Now we know then that at, after they have fertilized, so in fact let me write here fertilization and embryo development. Now we'll talk in uh, throughout this podcast what happens during fertilization and early embryonic development to the expression of imprinted genes and other methylated genes. But what I want to point out now is after embryonic development, and we have a person here, we know that their cells contain the maternal IFG that is off and the paternal that is on. But if this individual happened to be, say, female, we know that its gametes, her gametes, will all have to be with IFG off. Otherwise, we could never make a new child that is differentially expressed for IFG. So what happens during this whole process, during fertilization and embryonic development in the adult to establish or maintain this differentially expression of these imprinted genes? And then what happens as she makes gametes to make sure that all of her gametes have a down-regulated or a non-expressed copy of IFG2. And the opposite would be true if the individual were to be male. If they were male, their gametes would all have to be expressing IFG2. How do we make sure that happens? And that's what we're going to focus on. So let's go back and start talking about fertilization and what happens during fertilization that allows for these changes in methylation. So if we have the sperm here, and then we have the oocyte here, they each contain a haploid count of the genomic material. But let's talk about what's happening with the genetic material in the sperm first. The DNA is completely dehydrated. Functionally, it's rather useless. You're not going to turn on genes, you're not going to copy it, you're not going to do anything. It's just this package of DNA that's waiting to be delivered to the oocyte. It's held together, this dehydrated DNA, with a non-histone protein called proteums, proteomines. So upon fertilization, as the DNA from the sperm is delivered to the oocyte, shortly after that, the paternal DNA and the maternal DNA exist in these pronuclei. They don't intermix yet. They will, but they don't do that yet. And a few things happen in this pronuclei with the sperm DNA. First, it's rehydrated. The proteomines are removed and maternal histones attach. So when the sperm enters here, it doesn't have any of its own histones. And so as we start to package that DNA, the histones that are present in the cytoplasm of the oocyte, I'll just make some H's here for histones, are incorporated into the pronuclei and begin to package the DNA. So our mom is responsible for all our histones. So thank you, mom. Another thing that happens is that the DNA is rapidly demethylated. All the methyl groups are removed. Actually, to be more clear, because I'm going to change this rule in a second, let's say most DNA is rapidly demethylated. Now I put these as step two and three here, but there's no 
evidence to suggest the order of these two. We know that the histones package the, the, the DNA and we know that the methyl groups are removed, but the order is not known. And we'll talk in a moment, um, but the ma maternal DNA is also demethylated. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. And though I hinted at it, I didn't specifically say it, so let's say it right now. This pronuclei, or pronucleus, where this is occurring in the, for the sperm DNA, provides the structure for differential demethylation. The reason I say differential is not differential within the sperm pronuclei, but it's different. The pattern of demethylation is different between the sperm DNA and the oocyte DNA. So now let's look at the overall demethylation that occurs between sperm DNA and oocyte DNA and see how that changes throughout embryonic development. So let's make this graph here. Over here we have over here we have percent methylation from 0 to 100 and down here we're going to have different stages of development. So here are the gametes, so egg and sperm. Next we'll have the zygote. Next we'll have the one cell stage, that point at, at which the pronuclei have fused. I'm going to skip a couple divisions here and move to the eight cell stage. I then want to talk about the morula stage. The morula stage is a stage that is often described as a ball of cells. And then we have the blastocyst. This stage occurs when this ball of cells, the morula stage, begins to hollow out. And you form this inner mast cell region here, which will eventually become the embryo. And then these cells on the outside they will eventually become part, not the only ones, but become part of the extra embryonic cells. So these are the trophoblast cells. So we begin to see some differentiation at the blastocyst stage. Okay, so now let's look here at how sperm is demethylated by looking at the percent of methylation. In the sperm, it's at 100% methylated. It begins to drop off a little at that zygote, but not much. But between the zygote and the one cell stage, it plummets down to virtually zero. And then it'll stay at around that zero percent mark, all the way till the morula stage. At the morula stage, it will begin to rise again. And by the time you hit the blastocyst stage, you're at 100 percent methylation again. Egg demethylation and remethylation occurs at a slightly different pace. It will remain 100% methylated until the one cell stage. At the one cell stage, it will slowly become demethylated until about the eight cell stage, when it's about 0% about methylated. At the morula stage, it will become remethylated at a pace similar to that of the sperm. And then by the time you get to the blastocyst stage, it is 100% methylated. So it goes through this process of demethylating the DNA, both sperm and eggs. Why, why don't we label these just so we keep track of it? So this was maternal and this was paternal. So as I was beginning to say, we go through this elaborate process of demethylating the DNA and then remethylating it as the cells become more specialized. Now an interesting thing, now an interesting thing happens here. It's the methylation pattern that is found in this blastocyst stage is nearly identical to what's seen here. The genes that were methylated here are remethylated here. How it knows to do that, we don't know yet. And it's not 100% perfect. So it's not exact clones, so to speak, of, but it's pretty close. So a question that may come up is why do we even demethylate and then remethylate? Why not just maintain that same methylation pattern? Well, there must be a reason. Don't know what it is, but there must be a reason because it's energetically very unfavorable to do this. Okay, another interesting thing that we should point out here and spend a little time talking about is that on the previous whiteboard, if you, re if you remember, I said most of the genes are demethylated. Well, it turns out the imprinted genes are not for both males and females. So I'm going to show, just indicate that up here with this dotted line. 
And I'll show up both with male and female here. So these are male, I mean female imprinted. And these are male imprinted. Now, as most things with epigenetics and in imprinting, everything's not 100%. There are some genes that don't follow this rule. I'm just explaining the general rule that we see with imprinted genes, and they do not undergo this demethylation pattern. So why is that? And the basic answer is, we don't know. It's one of these big black boxes that we still have with epigenetics and imprinting. There's a lot of those. However, what I think is I think that the necessity to maintain these genes in their imprinted or their off state is so important that there can't be a risk of demethylating and remethylating. Because remember I said that even though we get remethylation, it's, it's not 100% accurate. There are some genes that get missed in the remethylation or not methylated in the same way in general, it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. And so I tend to think the reason that we don't see imprinted genes being demethylated is because maintaining their off state for the imprinted genes is too important. But that's just a Gorsuch thought. That's not a scientific proven thought. Just my hypothesis. Now the next question is how? Again, we don't know. But there is some thoughts that there is this oocyte specific DMR, DMT, so that once the sperm has fertilized the egg, this specific oocyte DMR DNA methyltransferase is active and will specifically target the imprinted genes. How it would know which ones to target, again, we don't know. But there is some evidence for this specialized DMR, DMT. We also know that there are some special histone marks, most of which we, we've seen before, but they seem to be pro pronounced a little bit more strongly in these imprinted genes in the egg and sperm. So the ones that are imprinted, that is they're off, will have the H3K9 methylated. More striking is that it is hypoacetylated. Very few acetylations on H3 and H4. On the genes that are, are not imprinted. We see some of our favorites here like H3K4 being methylated and H3K9 being acetylated. And I don't have a lot of room here, but all, just as striking as we see the hypoacetylation of H3 and H4 in the imprinted genes. In the non-imprinted genes, we see a hyperacetylation of H3 and H4. So we don't know how it occurs or how it's regulated, but we do see these hypo and hyperacetylated regions, which might lend to the strength of keeping the, those groups methylated. So now, what's happening post-blastocyst stage? Once the embryo has implanted, the embryo usually implants around the blastocyst stage. What happens after that? We know, as differentiation occurs, that different genes will become methylated or demethylated. We also know that imprinted genes by and large, don't ever become expressed. And as I said in the very opening of this podcast, we know that the germ cells, the sperm and the egg, have to reset their, their imprinting to match the sex of the individual. So what happens next? That's what I want to talk about as we begin to differentiate. And I'm going to focus mainly on the next whiteboard, thinking about the germline. Okay, so let's talk about the germline. So in discussing the germline, Let's first give it a simple definition. These are specialized cells in multicellular organisms that give rise to gametes. So where do they come from? Well, during embryonic development, there is a small pocket of cells called the primordial germ cells. These primordial germ cells will migrate to the gonads and differentiate into the germline. Now, with the exception of imprinted genes, the DNA in the primordial germ cells have been demethylated and then remethylated. And remember, in these primordial germ cells, the imprinted genes 
are still imprinted. Now what happens as we go from primordial germ cells to the fully differentiated germ line is a second round of demethylation. And in this case, the imprinted genes are demethylated as well. So by the time the primordial germ cells have reached the gonads and begun to differentiate it, the DNA has been demethylated. Now, some remethylation occurs, but the main thing that gets remethylated here are the imprinted genes. Imprinted genes are remethylated, but not to the original state, but remethylated to match the sex of the individual. So for the case of IGF2, as we said before, if this individual were female, all the copies of IGF2 in the germline would be imprinted, would be off. But if they were male, they wouldn't be imprinted. I should also say there is a temporal, temporal for time, so temporal regulation. What I mean by that is once in the gonads, all the DNA that needs to be imprinted or remethylated isn't immediately remethylated. Some of these genes aren't remethylated until after puberty or as an egg is being released, it gets remethylated. And so there's no exact rule for all of the imprinted genes. But we do know that they do get remethylated, they get re-imprinted, but the regulation is often time dependent, developmental dependent. So I want to spend just a little bit of time thinking about how they're going to be re-imprinted. And what you'll soon figure out is that, like a lot of this, we're still trying to understand it. We have some clues, we, we have some studies that have been done that start to, start to shed the light on the bigger picture, but we still really don't know. But let me tell you a little bit about what we do know. So we're gonna talk about here establishing the imprinted germline. So to, to remind you from the last whiteboard, what we said was that the imprinted genes throughout embryonic development and into adulthood are not reset. They're not demethylated and then remethylated. But those cells, the primordial germ cells that go onto the germline, are demethylated and then re-imprinted. Some of the things that, some observations we have that shed light on how they're re-imprinted in the germline is that DNMT3B from way back in the earlier part of the semester is expressed in the germline at the time of de novo from scratch for de novo methylation. So it's hypothesized that DNMT3B is the DNMT that is responsible for setting the methylation pattern of the germline. How it knows which genes to imprint is another story that we don't know an answer to yet. Now other DNTPs have a specific pattern of expression during gametogenesis. Now I want to talk about specifically DNMT3L. And I want to remind you what DNMT3L does from earlier in the semester. And so real briefly, I'll draw it down here. We have our chromatin structures here with our histones. And I'm going to make this one histone 3. When histone 3 is methylated at lysine 9, so H3, K9, DNMT3L will bind that methyl group. And when it binds that methyl group, it brings in DNMT3. Because DNMT3 binds to DNMT3L. As DNMT3 comes along here, it will methylate the DNA, which then turns this gene off, or sets the stage for keeping that gene turned off. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when DNMT3L is mutated. In oocyte production, it will still form the oocyte, and it can still be fertilized, but the resulting embryo dies about mid-gestation. So about halfway through pregnancy, the embryo dies. Now if we disrupt DNMT3L during sperm development, they don't enter meiosis, so they stay diploid, the spermatogonium, and then those diploid cells go through apoptosis. They go through a cell, a cell death program. 
So DMT3L during gamete development is very important in recruiting DMT3 to these sites to methylate the DNA. So the last thing I want to talk about is the evolutionary significance of imprinting. That is, why is it important? The differentially imprinting of one set of alleles and not the other set of alleles, this elaborate process of resetting the imprinting pattern in a sex-dependent manner must be important. It would seem to be incredibly in energy inefficient for this big process to occur just to occur. There has to be an evolutionary significance, one would imagine. We also know it's important because we know if we disrupt this imprinting pattern, it can have devastating effects to the embryo or to the baby that's born. We saw that effect when we looked at IFG, but I want to bring back something we talked about very early in the semester. I, it was in the video we watched the second day of class, where we talked about Prater-Willi and Angelman syndrome. And in discussing this, let's think about our paternal chromosome here, it's chromosome 15, and our maternal chromosome 15. It's in this region, so it's, it's not the same gene. There are different genes that cause Prater, Willie, or Angerman. So let me actually write those up here. Okay, so they're on chromosome 15, and interestingly, they're in the same cluster as IGF-2. It's one of the reasons we stumbled across IGF-2 because of these diseases as they were being investigated. So this gene here, we're going to call that the Prater, Willie gene. It's not really what it's called, but it's the gene that when mutated has prater willi syndrome. And this bottom one here we're going to call angel wing. Now, the chromatin that comes from dad, the prater willi gene is expressed, and the prater willi associated gene from mom is imprinted. The gene for Angelman syndrome that causes Angelman syndrome, from the paternal source, it is imprinted. The maternal source, it is expressed. And there are other genes here that are, that are also imprinted, and they're under the control of similar regulatory sequences of those non-coding RNA. What we know is that by various mechanisms, the paternal chromosome is deleted. Well, not all of it, but this part here where the prater willi gene is, and even the whole part here. So I'll say the paternal source, when mutated, causes prater willi. However, when the maternal source is mutated, it causes Angelman syndrome. Same genes in both cases, but when we delete this region here from the maternal source, we get Angelman syndrome. When we mutate this region here from the paternal source, we get Prater Willi. And we're going to come back, and we're t in a few chapters, we're going to come back and talk about Prater Willi and Angelman syndrome. So this is just a brief intro, but I think it provides a, an interesting insight into why it's so important that this imprinting is maintained. And and more importantly, what happens when it's not maintained. But it really still doesn't get at why it's important. Why do we have to have that? Because having that, as you just saw, I shouldn't have erased it yet, but having that set up by just mutating one or the other, you don't have that backup like you might see with typical genes that aren't imprinted. But in this case, you mutate one or the other, you're going to end up with a syndrome. A different syndrome, but still a syndrome. So there's got to be an an evolutionary advantage. And one of the favorite hypotheses is this one called parental conflict hypothesis. So what is the parental conflict hypothesis? In general what this means is the differing expression of imprinted genes is caused by the de by demands of evolutionary fitness needs of a given sex so if we just think about IFG remember IFG when expressed we can think of this as making larger progeny when IFG is not expressed you get smaller progeny now, males and females have different evolutionary fitness demands. The father wants his progeny to be large. He wants his, if you're thinking about a, an animal that has multiple offsprings, and sometimes even multiple fathers, 
he would want his progeny to be stronger than the other ones, to get more nutrients from the mom, because it's bigger, it's gonna take more nutrients. And in that way, his genes are more likely to be passed from generation to generation. And that's a strong evolutionary force. If his progeny are gonna be more fit, then that's a plus. Now mom, not surprisingly, she's more reasonable. She wants all her progeny to have equal size. And probably not super small, because that would be unhealthy. She would want to have a medium-sized child because she also has a desire to have more progeny. If for some reason her progeny are so large that she dies during childbirth, then that doesn't benefit her at all, of course. And she won't be able to have more children. She won't be able to pass on her genes. So if all of her progeny have equal size, that means equal access to nutrients. She wouldn't want to have one particularly larger child than another one because all of those children have her genome. And she, from an evolutionary perspective, wants to pass her genome on to the next generation. Dad doesn't care about the other siblings. He just wants to pass his genomes on to the next project, next generation. And so what happens with imprinting, it's sort of like this genetic compromise. Dad wants a big baby, mom wants to have average size babies. And so by combining, by only letting one be expressed, you end up with progeny that are equal size, but big enough to survive. Now, not all imprinted genes influence the size of the progeny. So when we think about the parental conflict hypothesis, which we'll do later on, sometimes it's not always about the size of, a, of the organism but it still has to somehow reflect the fitness demands of a given sex so that their progeny have a, a stronger, ev stronger evolutionary significance. Okay, we'll talk more about this in class, um, but I'm going to end this podcast now. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I'll see you in class.